I'm Patty Wagstaff. As a champion aerobatic pilot, I compete with gravity almost every single day. If it weren't for my skills and aircraft, it would be an uneven match. I enjoy the challenge of flying fast. The NASA team faces challenges too. They encourage us all to push our knowledge and skills to a higher level. My airplane flies over 200 miles per hour. How fast do you think astronauts have to go to reach Earth orbit? 2,000? 10,000. How about over 17,000? That's right, 17,500 miles per hour. Speed isn't the only challenge. Safety is very important. And making spaceflight less expensive is another. To be a part of the team tackling these challenges, you'll need to do well in school, especially in math, science, and technology. On today's NASA Connect, we'll be working with NASA scientists and engineers to explore the technologies that will be needed by the next generation of space explorer. That's you. So, get ready to take off with your hosts, Jennifer Pulley and Dan Giroux, on this episode of NASA Connect. Pulley, your host, along with Dan Giroux, who's joining us remotely from the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. You know, we're real excited to be here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, for part of this NASA Connect. Teachers, make sure you have the educator guide for today's program. It can be downloaded from the NASA Connect website. In it, you'll find great math-based hands-on activities and information on our instructional technology components. On this episode of NASA Connect, we're visiting NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. There, we'll meet NASA scientists and engineers who are exploring the challenges of building the next generation of reusable spacecraft. My friends here are going to help me figure out what it takes to get into orbit. How can we do that? By learning how NASA is getting spacecraft into orbit more safely and less expensively. Can't we just keep doing it the way we always have? Well, you know, things change, and we need to change in order to continue our journey of exploration. Just think, we went from the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903 to landing on the moon in 1969. As you can see, people have been dreaming of flight for ages. One of those dreamers was American Robert Goddard, an early experimenter with rockets. His work continues to inspire generations of scientists. These rockets are the results of Goddard's and other pioneers' imagination and hard work. Now it's your turn. You are the next generation of space explorers. Whoa, that's way cool. I know, it really is, Zach. And you know, just as the early space programs of NASA, like Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, led us to the shuttle, the shuttle leads us to the next generation of spacecraft. What's that? That's what this show is all about, Seema. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm pumped, but how do we get these heavy rockets off the ground? You know, Zach, that's a really good question, and what do we mean by the word heavy? Well, what we call heavy is just a way of measuring gravity. Gravity is a force of attraction between objects. Everything in the universe is attracted to everything else. Sometimes it's powerful, but sometimes it's weak. The amount of attraction really depends on the mass of the objects. Mass? Drink one of the robots in the you owe me a soda. <laughs> hey, Zach, pick Cassie and I up one, too. <laughs> Mass is not the same as weight. Think about how astronauts become nearly weightless in space. When they are on the moon, they weigh only one-sixth of their weight on Earth. For example, a man who weighs 180 pounds on Earth would weigh 30 pounds on the moon. They didn't shrink, did they? Their mass is the same, so what causes their weight to change? Gravity. The force of attraction between objects. On Earth, we feel gravity because of Earth's mass. Weight is just how we measure gravity's pull on things. In space, gravity is less because we are further away from the Earth's mass. The further away from a large mass like our Earth, the less gravity, and therefore, the less weight. What does this have to do with building spacecraft? Everything, Zach. The mass of a spacecraft determines its weight. And the more a spacecraft weighs, the more force is needed to reach orbit. 
force? I thought we were talking about gravity. Hmm, okay, I think we need to talk about some basics here. Lucky for us, 17th century English scientist Sir Isaac Newton explained the relationship of mass to gravity. He said we need force to overcome gravity. Newton described this relationship as a series of laws. Newton helped our understanding of gravity with his first law. What Newton said is easy to understand. An object at rest will stay at rest unless a force moves it. With a spacecraft, we need to come up with the force to move it. So we need to keep the weight, I mean, mass low, right? Correct. Keeping the mass low will mean less weight at launch. The force of gravity on the spacecraft is equal to the force of the launch pad holding it up, what Newton called balanced forces. We have to unbalance these forces to move the spacecraft. How do we do that? Well, Cassie, Newton explained in his second law that if a force is applied to a body of mass, the body will move in the direction of the force. Newton also described in his third law that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The thrust of a rocket motor is the action. The reaction is the spacecraft leaving the pad. Thrust measures the power of a rocket engine. The thrust must be greater than the force of gravity that keeps a rocket on the launch pad. For example, if the thrust, T, of a rocket is 75 kilograms and the weight of the rocket, W, is 50 kilograms, then subtracting 50 from 75 would equal 25 kilograms of upward force, F. To get into orbit, you need to keep the upward force greater than the force of gravity. When you ride an amusement park ride like the Space Shot here at the Space and Rocket Center, you are overcoming gravity as you rise up. At the top, you experience free fall or microgravity, just like the astronauts. You just don't stay in free fall very long because you drop back downward as the downward force of gravity becomes greater than the upward force. Awesome. The force of gravity is measured in units called g's. At sea level, that force equals one g. So we need more than one g of force to move the rocket? Pretty much, Seema, but you know, it's not as easy as it sounds. Let's take the Saturn V rocket of the Apollo program. Now, how much do you think that rocket weighed at launch? Remember how fast a spacecraft needs to travel in order to reach orbit. Yes, 17,500 miles per hour. Correct, and that's over 28,000 kilometers per hour. The Saturn V is taller than the Statue of Liberty and weighed over six million pounds at launch. The Saturn V's engines had to produce over seven and a half million pounds of thrust to have enough upward force to overcome the downward force of gravity. Okay, I get it. If we keep the weight of the rocket down, we won't need as much engine thrust to move it. Right, you guys are so smart. You know, engineers deal with this all the time. They use math to compare the vehicle weight to the thrust of the engines. Now this can be written as a ratio. And a ratio is, is just a simple way of comparing one thing to another. In this case, vehicle weight compared to thrust. So let's talk about the Saturn V. Let's say it weighs a million pounds and it produces a million pounds of thrust. The ratio for that would then be one to one and wouldn't go anywhere. But the Saturn V engine created seven and a half million pounds of thrust and the vehicle weighed six million pounds. Yeah, so that's a ratio of 7.5 to 6. Or let's see, 5 to 4. Exactly. Now you see how important it is to build rockets more lightweight. A couple of ways NASA scientists and engineers tackle this problem is by using lightweight materials and designing more efficient engines. Today, NASA is working on the next generation of reusable spacecraft, or launch vehicle system. We call it the Space Launch Initiative, or SLI for short. Later, we'll work with NASA researchers to learn how they deal with these challenges. But first, let's visit Dan for this show's web-based activity. Thanks, Jennifer. Today, we're visiting the Challenger Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The students from the Chattanooga School of Arts and Sciences will be helping us today on this web-based activity. The Challenger Center provides students and teachers several simulated space missions. During the missions, students work as a team to solve problems and apply math, science, and technology concepts to real-life situations. Sir and Denise, this is Mark and Charles. A message for the comm team. Over. Each year, the center provides over 8,000 students an opportunity to rendezvous with a comet, work on a space station, or take a voyage to Mars. 
We're using the center's computer lab to highlight this episode's web activity. Earlier today, we talked about the importance of the math concept of ratios to scientists and engineers. On the NASA Connect website, you can learn more about ratios by clicking on Dan's Domain. You'll find a link to the show's instructional technology activity, a zone just for teachers, and a career zone where you can meet some of our show's guests and learn about their jobs. Selecting this show's instructional activity will take you to River Deep's Destination Math, Mastering Skills, and Concepts 5. You'll find activities that make learning about ratios fun, and it's free to NASA Connect educators. Click on Ratios and Proportions. Teachers, you'll find a variety of clever ways to teach about ratios. From the Connect website, you can also order a great CD that will have you designing your own planes and learning more about ratios in no time. Just select the Exploring Aeronautics CD from NASA's core website. On the main menu, you can select the Resource Center to find out about the history of flight, or pick the Activity Center to learn more about the lift and drag. Jennifer, I've been having fun designing aircraft using the Exploring Aeronautics CD. So tell me, what have you found out about the next generation of reusable spacecraft? You know, the one I'll be driving. Wait a minute, sport. Don't you have to finish school and a few other things first? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think so. Okay, okay, I'll get back to work on that. Okay, you do that. Meanwhile, we've got a lot of work to do, and Norbert's gonna help me out. What is a reusable launch vehicle, or RLV? Why do spacecraft need to be lightweight? How is the RLV protected during re-entry? Those are some good questions. Now, let's get some answers from Kathy Kynard. She's an engineer here at NASA Marshall. Kathy, what are some of NASA's design challenges for the next generation of spacecraft? Jennifer, we have a great bunch of talented folks from around the country helping us choose the best design. Some work for the government, some work for private companies, and others for universities. SLI is designing the whole system for the next generation of reusable launch vehicles. Okay, we keep saying next generation. What was the first generation? Good question. The Space Shuttle is the world's first reusable launch vehicle. The Space Shuttle Orbiter is designed to be launched again and again, so it is our first generation of reusable launch vehicles, or RLV. And that's why we talk about the next gen RLV. So what are some of the things you're doing to get ready for the replacement of the Space Shuttle? Well, the most important thing is safety. Uh, the challenge is to make the vehicle as light as possible without reducing safety or strength. Yeah, that's understandable. So I guess being lightweight isn't the only thing that matters. That's right. A part of the system might actually be heavier if, say, it made the whole system safer or less expensive to operate. The weight increase uh, might reduce costs and help make the crew travel safer. We definitely want to keep space travel routine and safe for those next generation space explorers. There are many things for the SLI program to consider and test different types of engines, fuels, and vehicle shapes, and these are only some of the parts of the entire system. We call the whole system the architecture, and we mean everything from mission planning to launch on orbit support to landing and getting the vehicle ready to fly again. Kathy, that sounds pretty challenging. Well, so have you come up with any designs yet? First, we had to decide what we wanted to do in space before we started designing. NASA sees the next generation RLV as doing two main things getting to the International Space Station, and taking satellites into orbit. We select preliminary designs that best meet our needs. Uh, one challenge vehicle designers face is what type of engine to use. Some engines use kerosene and liquid oxygen. Others may use liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Each option offers advantages. Well, why so much interest in engines? The type and performance of the main engines have a major influence on the whole spacecraft. They influence safety, weight, maintenance, preparation time, and cost. So what are some of the other things we can look for in the next generation RLV? Well, one of the things that you might see are the reusable boosters that fly back to the launch site. A booster? What's that? A booster is the primary or first stage of a multi-stage rocket. OK, that makes sense. But you said the boosters are going to fly back. <laughs> How do they do that? Well, they have onboard computers for navigation, and they also have onboard computers that work sort of like your nervous system alerting astronauts and people on the ground whenever there's any kind of problem. Right, that's really important. Now, besides the onboard computer systems, how else are you going to improve safety? 
Well, when a spacecraft goes from space to our atmosphere, friction with the air can heat up the outside of the vehicle to temperatures over 1,600 degrees centigrade. That's hot enough to melt steel. Uh, the part of the vehicle that protects the crew is called the Thermal Protection System, or TPS. So what is the Thermal Protection System made of, and how does it work? Currently, um, we are looking at a number of materials, but all Thermal Protection Systems work in two basic ways. The first way is absorption. Like a potholder, you design the skin of the spacecraft so that it can absorb the heat of re-entry without damaging the vehicle. The second way is radiation. The outside of the vehicle is designed to radiate the heat from re-entry like a fireman's coat protects him from a fire. Some designs will combine both of these approaches to protect the astronauts and spacecraft from the heat of re-entry. The TPS has to be thin and light, but still strong enough to do the job over and over again. Kathy, that sounds difficult. Well, it is challenging, but remember, crew safety, it's our number one concern. For the next generation spacecraft system, we'll have other changes too. Well, what sort of changes? Well, for instance, the space shuttle will carries both cargo and astronauts. Uh, for the next generation RLV, we want to divide those jobs. We are looking at two vehicles, a cargo ship with no crew on board and a smaller crew transport vehicle. Protecting the crew is much easier when they are not part of a huge cargo vehicle. The crew transport vehicle has a rocket engine to help it get away from the launch vehicle in case of any problems. The cargo vehicle doesn't need all the equipment required to protect people, so it can carry more cargo. It's really a win-win situation. That's super, Kathy. Thank you so much for all the information on the Space Launch Initiative. Now before we move on, it's time for a cue card review. If you're watching the show on videotape, pause the tape now and discuss these questions. What is a reusable launch vehicle or RLV? Why do spacecraft need to be lightweight? How is the RLV protected during re-entry? Now it's time for our viewers to get some hands-on experience building rockets. Us to show you this program's hands-on activity. You can download the educator guide and a list of materials from the NASA Connect website. Here are the main objectives. Students will gather statistical data, find the optimum ratio for best vehicle performance, explore mathematical problem solving, and explore mathematical models through graphing. Here are some terms you need to know. Propulsion is the act of driving forward or away. Thrust is a force produced by a rocket engine and reaction to high velocity exhaust gas. Kinetic energy is energy in motion, and momentum is a directional measurement of an object's motion, its tendency to continue moving in a particular direction. Good morning, class. Good morning, Ms. Smith. Today, NASA has asked us to gather statistical data so that we can determine the optimum ratio of our BSV rocket. Students will organize into groups of four, with each student taking on one of four jobs as pre-launch officer, launch officer, data recorder, and measurement technician. Roles can be rotated after every trial. Each group will construct the launch facility by placing 20 meters of masking tape on the ground in a straight line. Divide the length of masking tape into 10 centimeter intervals. Place the shoebox at one end of the masking tape. The rocket will be placed against it each time. It may be necessary for the pre-launch officer in the group to place gravel or dirt inside the box to stabilize it. Begin testing by using a push pin to attach a 2 centimeter baking soda packet to the bottom of the cork. The directions to assemble the baking soda packet can be found in the educator guide. Remember, each rocket must be filled with 115 milliliters of vinegar. Try to get vinegar all over yourself. Slide the cork with the baking soda packet attached into the neck of the bottle firmly. <laughs> The launch officer will rapidly shake the rocket three times to start the reaction of the baking soda and vinegar. Quickly place the corked end of the rocket against the shoebox and move away. Move to ignition and lift off. The measurement technician will call out the distance traveled by the rocket and the data recorder will write the distance on the distance data chart. The pre-launch officer will then prepare the rocket for the next trial. Repeat until all trials have been completed. Each group will plot the data onto a graph using a different color for each group. Students will compare the group's average data and analyze the shape of the graph to determine the best ratio of baking soda to vinegar. All right, class, in comparing the data, at what point did the recorded data start increasing? Erica? It started increasing immediately. 
Why would it be important for us to find the optimum amount of fuel to use for any rocket? Erin? Because you don't want to carry more or less than you need. Teachers, if you would like help with the baking soda rocket lesson, simply enlist the help of your AIAA mentor, who will be glad to help your class with these activities. AIAA stands for American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Boy, those kids looked like they were having fun. No, Jennifer, I did not say having a blast. But I wanted to. <laughs> the folks at NASA Marshall have an awesome program for next generation explorers to get a real feel for rocket science. It's called the Student Launch Initiative, SLI, just like the Space Launch Initiative. Initiative is the key word because these students design, build, test, launch, and reuse a rocket carrying a half pound experiment. They experience the thrill of seeing their rocket take off and soar from one and a half to over three kilometers high. That sound is good. Students from Huntsville area high schools and universities participated in NASA's first student launch initiative. The students use math, science, and technology to design and build their rockets, to develop websites, and to apply budgeting and planning principles. Five, four, three, two, one. Igniter. Wow, Jennifer, I really want to be part of one of these SLI teams. Speaking of teams, where are your teammates? Jennifer? Norbert? Ah, there he is. What is a computer simulation? How are computer simulations used to design spacecraft? How are math and science used to plan for the next generation ROV? The team and I are at the Collaborative Engineering Center, or CEC, here at NASA Marshall. The CEC is a facility that enables scientists and engineers from across the country to study spacecraft architecture in a virtual environment, kind of like a chat room, before they build the vehicles. They do this by using computer simulations. Kathy, if I remember correctly, a computer simulation is a powerful tool that allows engineers such as yourself to input data into a program. Exactly. We get to play, or I mean study, what ifs with different types of engines, structures, thermal protection, and whatever we want to test just by changing the data. That's great. Now, what do you have the kids working on today? Earlier, we talked about how different fuel choices which propel the spacecraft affect the launch weight of the vehicle. By using computer simulations, we can get a real-time idea of how these choices affect the whole architecture. The computer simulation shows how one change can ripple through the entire system, like waves on a pond. I get it. Computer simulations allow designers to see how one choice can affect the big picture. Yes, and another reason why simulations are so useful is because we have over 20 years of experience with the space shuttle. I see. So by looking at similar numbers and costs from the shuttle program, you have a starting off point to begin testing new ideas. Well, yes. Uh, sometimes, of course, we have to use, uh, engineers have to use their estimating skills to come up with a starting point for their calculations. Oh, well, can you give me an example? Sure. Suppose you are looking at TPS, thermal protection systems. Let's say that a low-maintenance TPS system weighs 3,000 kilograms, and the total weight of the vehicle is 75,000 kilograms. How would you estimate the thermal protection system weight to the vehicle weight ratio? Okay, let's see. 3,000 kilograms TPS weight to 75,000 kilograms of vehicle weight. If I simplify and reduce, it's about 1 to 25. Exactly. We might find that one system is heavier, but the reduced maintenance costs might still make it a good idea. Of course, eventually you have to build and test systems and hardware, but think of the time and money you save testing with the simulations first. And it allows more creativity. Absolutely. See how they're trying different thermal protection systems? Look what it does to the vehicle weight and structure, too. What did we do before we had all this technology? Well, for one thing, we did calculations by hand. We also built and tested a whole lot more hardware. Of course, that was okay then, but now engineers have so many more tools to help them, but they still must use math, science, and technology. 
First, there has to be computer scientists and mathematicians to design the software and hardware that is needed for computer simulations. Remember, the computer only calculates the data, but the engineers need sharp math and science skills to analyze the results and decide on the final design. The Space Launch Initiative will get a spacecraft to orbit more safely and less expensively. That's going to take a team effort, and it's not too early for your next generation explorers to start getting ready. Doing well in school is the most important step. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing all the information oh, no you did with us. We really appreciate it. The kids had a great time, and I'm sure I'm going to have a really hard time pulling them away from here. Oh, well, thanks for coming. You're welcome. Hey, while we're here, let's do our last cue card review. What is a computer simulation? How are computer simulations used to design spacecraft? How are math and science used to plan for the next generation RLV? If you're watching on tape, you can pause and discuss. And teachers, if you would like a videotape of this program and the accompanying educator guide, check out the NASA Connect website. Well, Dan, that wraps up this episode of NASA Connect. So the question of the day is, are you ready to join the next generation of space explorers? You better believe it, Jennifer. We'd like to thank everyone who helped make this program possible. If you have comments or suggestions about this episode or about NASA Connect in general, email us at connect at larc.nasa.gov. Or pick up a pen and write us at NASA Connect, NASA Center for Distance Learning, NASA Langley Research Center, Mail Stop 400, Hampton, Virginia, 23681. You can also link to NASA Core, the NASA Central Operations of Resources for Educators. To view this and past shows, go to NASA Quest at quest.nasa.gov. Until next time, stay connected to math, science, technology, and NASA. See, See you then. Bye. <laughs>